This is Dr. Jonathan Hansen. I want to welcome you all to the Warning Program. Wherever you're watching or listening, welcome. I have in the studio today Mary Solomon. She's a, I believe, a mighty woman of God. I've grown to really know her more and more. Appreciate everything she's doing for the kingdom's sake to try to keep America free. Uh, Mary, why don't you tell them again what you do? Okay, well, I, um, I'm just here in the state of Washington, and I teach and I speak on things um, that are near and dear to my heart. One of them is, of course, government and the church, and basically um, how to get the church to understand their civic responsibility, and um, it, because that's very important, according to Scripture. And so I wrote a book about that, and we talked about it before. And so that's what we're doing right now. We're just we're just going around the state, and you know, speaking on podcasts and doing what we can to encourage the church to rise up and be the church. You know, be that salt and light in government. And she's doing a fantastic job. I mean, uh, the church is the reason why we're in trouble in America. Actually, all over the world, the church has to res know their responsibilities, God-given responsibilities. The church in America used to understand that. That's why we became the greatest nation on earth. But we have slowly lost that responsibility. Uh, even a gospel that's been twisted to say we're supposed to stay out of politics. When originally, again, 13 colonies, if you wanted to run as a politician, 11 out of 13, you had to say Jesus Christ was your Lord, your Savior, and your God. And the Bible was used in the courtrooms for morality, justice, and ethics. Yes. And so just think about that. We wouldn't have an America if it wasn't for the pastors in the past, the Black Robe Brigade, during the Civil Revolution. Uh, they rose up, became the officers, took off their collars, grabbed the muskets, and led the call for freedom. The church has always been the backbone of this nation. Mary? Amen. They really have. And they're going to be the backbone again. Amen. <laughs> and so that's what she's trying to do. Frankly, that's what I'm trying to do in a different way. All over the world, we're trying to wake up the church. Yes. Now, Mary, you wrote a new book that's going yes. to come out, right? Yes, What's I the did. title? It's called A Woman of Substance, Teachings on the Proverbs 31 Woman. Say it and again. A Woman of Substance, Teachings on the Proverbs 31 Woman. Wow. Yeah. Uh, did you hear that? A woman of substance. I know my wife is going to want to read that book. Yeah. But why? She'll okay. Why don't it. you explain a little bit about it? Well, the um the reason why I I actually wrote a book that I wanted to read when I was a young mother. Okay. Because the thing is, is when I was a young mother, um, striving to be that perfect Christian wife and mother, I homeschooled my three sons, and I you know when you homeschool and I it, whether you homeschool or not, or if you're a mother of and a wife of one child, five children, ten children, or no children, but you are a Christian woman, and you want to be all that you can be in Christ in that in that domain, that family and marriage and raising of children. And so um, there was just a lot of things that um, I read that just didn't minister to me about the Proverbs 31 woman, and there were things I didn't really understand because— I would read about all of the things that she did, which if you're familiar with scripture and you read Proverbs 31, she does everything. And so um, back in those days and even today, I have um, I get so many opinions on her. And um, like one of the opinions is that she really doesn't exist, that she was just a poem and a figment of a man's, you know, imagination. Wow. Another um, opinion is, is that this is a span of a woman's life from like, like she didn't do all this all the time, but, you know, through like a span of her life of maybe 40 or 50 years, she did this and then she did this and she did that. So because a lot of women feel it's absolutely impossible for a woman to accomplish and do all those things, you know, you know, in a life in in everyday life. Um there's just all kinds of opinions about her. And for the most part, um, over the years, I feel that, that that those scriptures are pretty much ignored by a lot of Christian churches and women because they feel like she's like this champion, perfectionist woman that no one can live up to her standard. Okay. And so, um, and in some ways, I agree. And um, it's true. I mean, if you read about her, she, um, she rises up while it's still dark and goes to sleep after it's dark. It says her candle never um, goes out, 
you know, um, she um, she does uh, she she's into real estate. She buys a vineyard and, 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 you know, buys property and grows a vineyard. She um, handles the distaff. She works with um, she's a marketer. She works with textiles. And back then it was called pr- um, purple or scarlet. Sure. And that material was actually only the wealthy and royalty wore that material and traded in it. Wow. Um, she, um, it says that her husband um, rises up and, you know, calls her blessed and no one is like her. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Um, I mean, I don't have the scriptures in front of me, but anybody that knows what I'm talking about, she does just about everything. She, um, it says that she rises up early and gives her servants their tasks and their duties. So she's an administrator. So basically the one thing that I had to fi- finally do for me is because people would constantly put her in a box. A lot of men that teach on her just talk about supposedly this submissive wife that does all of these domestic duties, and you don't really see her out in the forefront. And so there was just a lot of things that I felt like a lot of religious dogma attached to her. So what I did is I basically studied her for many years, and I dug in like I always do, and I researched, and I had to find if she really did exist, and if she did exist, when did she exist, and how really, what, who was she? So what I found out through my research is that she, a lot of people think she was Solomon's wife, or Solomon wrote about her, or it was during Solomon's time, but when you actually... Um, read Proverbs 30 woman uh, in the Hebrew text and you begin to study the the um, linguistics of Proverbs 31 and actually it's Proverbs I believe um, oh I think it starts in 9 through I'm sorry I, I don't have my notes in front of me 9 through something but there's 1 through 9 Proverbs 1 through 9 and Proverbs 31 the linguistics are different um, when you research it from the other chapters in Proverbs, meaning that those Proverbs 1 through 9 and Proverbs 31, actually theologians have come that study the linguistics, have come to find out that that those scriptures actually came probably from the Persian period wow. of time. Wow. And during per, the Persian period, there were um, the, the that was the time that the um, Israelites came out of um um, Babylon and the Gola community came to establish themselves back in um, Judah. And so these people that came back were this elite people that were very wealthy and came back to establish themselves and grow the community and become, you know, the set apart holy community. So some theologians really believe that the Proverbs 31 woman came out of the Gola community. And the thing is, is today, to our today's standards, when you really study about her and her business attributes, she would be a multimillionaire. Wow. Wow. And no one, and that is the actual truth. And if you go back and read her, the scriptures, you can't do all of the things that she did. It, just even the, the dealing in purple and textiles and trading, it says that the ships from afar, they use it, she brings her foodstuffs from ships of afar. They're talking about the Phoenician ships and the trade market at that time. And you cannot deal in textiles without being extremely wealthy. And, um, and that's just one thing. She buys real estate. She invests in real estate. She and, and so just those two things alone, those two commodities would have made her a multimillionaire. And then it says at the end that she sits in the gates, not only with her husband. Her husband sits in the gates, and we know that gates represent authority and power, right? Gates are always symbolic of doors of power and authority. Yeah. And that when when in the Old Testament, when they sat at the city gates— that's where the governing elders and rulers would come to decide judicial things. They decide what's going on. The gates of the city always represent governing authority. Well, it says that her husband sits at the city gates among the elders. So he is somebody probably like some type of a governor or, you know what I mean, r- r- ruling the city with sure. the others. Sure. But then it says her own works sits at the gates. She's there, too. And so I think that if you really study scripture and you really 
take it for, you know what I mean? Like you, you have to study it in its historical content. You, it's just not some little flowery poem and like, oh, I want to be the Proverbs 31 woman and I want to cook and clean and be submissive to my husband. And I want uh, Christian wives to be submissive to their husbands because there is an order in the marriage. And I know maybe there's another side of the church of women will say that they don't like me hearing that, but there is. The Bible says that Christ is the head of man and the head of um, a woman is her husband. And so there's a submission order. And why is there order? There's order so there won't be chaos and lawlessness. And so don't get me wrong. The scripture also says we are to submit to one another in love. And, and, and the marriage should be a perfect union. So I'm not suggesting that... Um, a husband dominate his wife. I'm not suggesting that a wife rebel and not um, bless her husband. So it's a submission to one to another, a perfect union. But there is an order. So, but the thing is, is a lot of times when people, the church, old religious order teaches on the Proverbs 31 one woman, it's always in this submissive, domestic, um, behind the husband away. thing. That's all I'm trying to clarify, yeah, that yeah. that's not what she was. Yeah. She was not that person. Yeah, she and wasn't so, a docile floor mat. No. I, and so, anyway, so we talk about her historic, in the book, I talk about her historical. That's her historical. If you look at, so the book is broken up into four parts. The first part is my thesis of today, and I, I talk a lot about Biblical womanhood versus feminism, which I want to, you know, get into in a minute, um, because that's really what the battle is right now. The battle is in our culture right now is the traditional b biblical Christian woman and wife versus the feminist. And that's the the the, um, the battle and the war of the family. And so in the first part of the book, which I'm going to get back to the, the, the feminist, I talk about that. The second part of the book is the historical Proverbs 31 woman in history. Then I go into t the Titus 2 women in the New Testament and their story and the champions, the women champions in the Bible in the New Testament, like Priscilla, Phoebe, um, and Lydia. And Lydia, to go back to Lydia, again, another very wealthy woman dealing in purple that had a home that opened up her home, the Apostle Paul. So we can talk about that another time. So then I get into that historical thing. And then in the um, third part of the book, I go into symbols and themes and um Themes like because there's themes of the Proverbs 31 woman, like spiritual themes. Like one thing I, I when I study the Proverbs 31 woman over the years, I always felt like she, her her life is so perfect in order and the way God the way the scriptures are designed that it kind of reminded me in the spiritual sense of the bride of Christ. You know what I mean? Without spot or wrinkle. And so, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, but you know what I mean? that kind of, And then, yes, and yes. then her life, another part, another theme I wrote about is um, her order. The, or, the order of her day, the order of her life, and the spirit of order and how God is a God of order and even all of creation is order. So there's themes, you know, that I kind of pull from. And then the last part is um, up to date. Um, all the practical application, like how do we take those scriptures and apply it to our life today as women? So there's parts, there's, a, there's an application on, um, you know, um, ta table setting, meals, a marriage, time management, tips. So it's a pretty full book, you know, and I'm really excited about it. Okay, we're going to get back to this book in a minute, but uh, if you've just tuned in, you're listening, watching The Warning Program. My name is Dr. Jonathan Hansen. I'm the president of World Ministries International and Eagles Saving Nations. I have Solomon, uh, Mary Solomon, in the studio live today. She's a leader, heavily involved in the Republican uh, Party as far as putting the right people in. That's what I said, the right people. Not all Republicans are conservative. Uh, we have rhino Republicans that are, uh, we don't want them in. But she's trying to put the right people into office, trying to wake up the church. Uh, the same thing I am trying to do. And so, uh, again, Mary Solomon. Now, she just wrote a book, and Mary, what's the name of the book again? A Woman of Substance, A Woman of Substance, Teachings on the Proverbs 31 Woman. Okay, A Woman of Substance, Teaching on the Proverbs 31 Woman. And so far, everything I heard, I like. Uh, I'll tell you what, women are not supposed to be docile. Uh, I wrote an article years ago 
Trinity in marriage. What does that mean? Well, it means that just like God in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, different roles, different responsibilities, but equality, Praise respect, God. That's and dignity. Wonderful. Yes. And I did it in line with marriage. So yes. again, we're not supposed to be tyrants over our wife. We're supposed to work in harmony mm -hmm. and we're supposed to cooperate. We have different roles sometimes and responsibilities, mm -hmm. and, uh, but we're supposed to honor one another. Yes. I know my wife is a Proverbs 31 woman. I honor her. I know her giftings and I support her. And uh, one day I'll sit back and applaud her when, when I'm, yes. it's her time to shine more yes. than me. And uh, I, I'm anxious for that. I'm telling you, uh, I want to support my wife and everything yes. God has called her to do and be. I'll be her number one fan. Yes, and, and so that's we, what good husbands, loving husbands do. They we do need that. to understand yes. this, ladies and gentlemen. And so uh, again, uh, Mary... Continue. Well, I wanted to just get into the feminist thing, because right now um, in our country, in our nation, we're at war. The family's at war. And one of the things where I think it actually started, well, they say it started like in the 1930s, which, you know, if you do your research and the communism and the socialism, I, I get all that. I mean, I, I mean, actually, the war started in Genesis when Satan entered the garden, right? I mean, women from that point have been the subject of, of war. Um, and, and the man, too. But, you know, um, women have been um, used as sex slaves, sex trafficking. I mean, there are men now and boys, little boys. God, God bless all of them. I pray that they all be delivered in this in this lifetime. But, um, but basically, the enemy went after the woman and the woman was deceived. And so the spirit of deception is something that um, the, ant the, the, the spirit of the age, the Antichrist spirit likes to go after. And so what happened? Um, I'm just going to go back as far as the 60s. So in the 60s, the, the spirit of um, Antichrist came in through feminism. And what happened is the book came out in the 60s. It was called, um, it was called The Feminine Mystique. Now, The Feminine Mystique was written by a woman named Betty Friedman. And she wrote in that book in the 60s that the home was a trap for women and the suburban housewife felt caged, lonely, and bored. She referred to the home as a concentration camp for women and that a woman's devotion to her husband and children is a sacrifice of such magnitude that it inevitably stunts her growth as an individual. Raising children, Friedman argued, is a thankless pursuit that doesn't allow women to use their intelligence in a manner that benefits society. And so with her um, empowerment of what she did with that book, she got thousands, untold thousands of women to leave their home and leave their children and go out into the workforce. So that left an open door for what well, we know. We know what it left because yeah. then you have the wife out of the home. You have the husband out of the home. If you think that your home is a concentration camp and not a blessing, if you think that children, you're not, you're not using your intellect when you're raising children. So she was in with the, with the feminist movement, they were able to deceive that generation of women. And then there was, the the, the um, sexual revolution where you know they don't they don't have to be married they don't have to have children uh, hey you get pregnant have an abortion this all got birthed from this in the 60s and so then what had happened is it just launched you know taking the prayers out of the school it just it just an onslaught against the family well now you come the 70s and then you come the 80s and what happens is the media the news the television shows the movies all portray women as these superpower champions, superheroes, and men as these weak, docile, no authority. So the feminist movement, what is actually done is tore the woman away from her home and her marriage and has stripped the men of all their authority. A woman, a Christian, biblical women don't do that. No. Biblical women are called, and see the scripture says in Proverbs that a, a wise woman builds her house a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. Hands are, are, are a symbol for power and work. A wise woman of God can build her house and strengthen it and make it a fortification for the husband, the children. You build the family. You're building your neighborhood. You're building your community. Foolish woman, foolish women will tear it down, tear the marriage down, tear the family down, tear the next generation down. Do you realize that women are so powerful 
in the Lord, in Christ, that we can change the world and change our nation by building our family, by building up our children, by building our husband, by building our community. And this is the thing is you, um, you women will say, well, I, I want to do a business or I, I, I want to work or I want to do that. You, you can do whatever you want to do, but you don't have to do it in such a way that you're tearing your family down and your, and your husband down and your children down. You can come together with your husband and work together and decide, in Christ, we're going to build our home. In Christ, our foundation will be the Word of God. In Christ, we're going to figure out, okay, you're going to do this and you're going to do this, but we're not going to let our children go. We're not going to let our children go to the, the Netflix and to the, the, the boxes and to the phones and to... Being, you know, the latchkey kids. So many women in that generation, the 60s and 70s, even the 80s, were going after a corporate career, and the kids were latchkey kids coming home from home from school at two o'clock, locking themselves in the house until somebody got home at six or seven. What? Who was the adult in the room? The television. Yes. This is not a godly biblical home. Women can Christian women can be in business. They can be in ministry. They can raise their children. You go back to the. Proverbs 31 woman, she did it all and her children rose up and were blessed. Why? Because the foundation is the word of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We are not demoniacs. We are not sexual deviants. We are godly women that love our husbands, love our children, love our community. And by the Holy Spirit, we will be led to do the right things and we will be successful. You, the home is not a concentration camp and our marriage is not a prison. We are blessed. We are best blessed by the Lord to bear fruit for the kingdom and God will give you wisdom and he will give you honor and he will bless your finances and he will bless your health. You just need to look to him and you need to look to other women in the community that will support you, that believe like you, that will help you. Do not look to the feminist women. Do not look to Oprah. Do not look to The View. Do not look to these crazy women um, you know, on these television shows that p- these other young women are being led astray and idolized, and they look up to them as goddesses, and they're not raising their children, and they're not um, blessing the Lord, and they're leading women astray. And now the next feminist movement, that was the feminist movement of the 1670s now the movement has gone is the same movement the blm the black lives matter movement where they are actually in their um in their um values or whatever their mission statement is to destroy the nuclear family they don't want the mother father child family that god that God created. They want that destroyed. They don't believe in a traditional family. That's where biblical women come in. Um, and they say, no, we're going to raise our children, one biological man, one biological woman. We have our children. We raise them in the Lord. And see, outside of that, the feminists, do you know that the feminists, they were all for women's rights until they weren't? They will not even defend now the women of these men, the men that are dressing up as women in women's sports. They won't, these feminists won't defend the women anymore. So what was it really about? What was the feminist movement about? Was it really about women's rights? Because right now, even the women's rights that they thought that they lifted up, they're stripping aside and saying, no, we're not even going to protect women's sports. We're not going to protect the girls in the locker rooms. That wasn't that what the feminist movement was all about or was it? was it all about? No, it wasn't all about. From the beginning, it was the destruction of the home and the family. And so anyways, the feminists are on the side of the transgenders. They don't care about women anymore. You're so exactly again, right. Yeah. yeah. The LGBT is just a continuation of the destruction of the family. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. And Mary has spelled it out very clear. The nucleus of a nation, the strength is the family. This has been a direct attack on the family. Or you could say a direct attack on the authority of God himself to preserve a nation. Again, I've had Mary Solomon on the warning program today. Uh, she's a dynamo, huh? Did you like that? I enjoyed that. My wife will really like this message. And I pray all of you do. Again, Mary Solomon, she's heavily involved in trying to uh, get the church woken up, get the right people into office so we can preserve a nation. And she writes books. Tell them the name of this book one more time. A Woman of Substance, uh, Teachings on the Proverbs 31 Woman, and it will be out in September, October. Again, 
You're watching, listening to The Warning Program. This is Dr. Jonathan Hansen. We need your help if you want us to continue on your radio, television stations. Telephone 360-629-5248. Look at my website, worldministries.org. Join Eagle Saving Nations. We're also trying to wake up America to preserve this nation so we can be under Jesus Christ and not tyranny. God bless you. Amen.